Okay. Um, can we start out by having you introduce yourself a bit and uh, tell us a little bit about your relationship to clay? Hey, my name is Akin Sonia Cambone, and I was born Mark Teamer in Sacramento, California in 1946. The first memory I have is in Del Paso Heights. That's where we live. My mother had bought a, a lot in Del Paso Heights, and then she bought a boxcar for $200 and she had it moved to her lot and she put some cement blocks underneath it so it would stand up and had a door and some windows cut in the boxcar. And that was a house. I was going to Lincoln Junior High School, which is right around the corner across the street from the Crocker. And I never knew what a museum was. I'd never seen a museum. I never heard of a museum. So at lunchtime, we would always take a break and we'd go off campus, off Lincoln and we cross the street and we go down to the Crocker and hop the fence. They had a fence out there. One day somebody said let's go inside the museum because the guy that guards the door is gone. The man that stands up there, they had a security officer there. So we all ran in and we run in and I ran in and I'm running and all of a sudden I looked up and I saw this great big old painting and I stopped and I couldn't move. And I'm looking at the painting and I'm saying, oh my God, look at this. I couldn't believe it. And the guys are, come on, Mark, come on. We gotta go, he's gonna catch us. And I'm in a daze. I was like mesmerized by this painting. And I'm trying to figure out how does anybody paint like this? I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So uh, I got caught <laughs> and I got kicked out. But all while he was taking me out, I'm looking, I'm still looking at the paintings because I couldn't believe it. And one of your teachers along the way, too, was one of our Sacramento artists, Gregory Condos, right? Yeah, Greg Condos. I had a class from him at City College, and I really loved his class. And I uh, had a teacher named Al Bird at City College, and he was the one that first introduced me to Raku. And why I'm so impressed with it is because uh, when you look at the work, sometimes you get these metallic lusters. The first thing is you create an image and then you take it out of the fire once it's bisque and you put the glazes wherever you want them, different colors. And once the glazes are on the piece, then you take it back to do the raku firing. And usually when you do a raku firing, you have a lot of people all firing their piece. And the way we do it, Sometimes we have women and they're dancing and the drummers are drumming and the women's are dancing. And you can feel the spirit in the air of what's taking place with this whole Raku process. Then everybody backs up and you open the kiln and you start taking the pieces out, putting them in smoking cans. And the smoke uh, mixes with the glazes and causes some type of a chemical reaction. And that's what gives you all the metallic lusters. I, I like to use eucalyptus leaves, sawdust, newspaper, uh, hay, all of these different combustibles. You, the, the more of them you put in, you, you never know what you're going to get. I've looked at a lot of African spirituality and a lot of the African heroes, if someone is special as a, a person, he takes the form of a deity and I like to incorporate the things that I learn into my own work. And you've also traveled pretty extensively too. Well, that's my biggest influence is my travels in Africa. I think I've been to Africa 14 times. And I always go to do research and I do research on African art. And I live with the Bambara people in um, Mali. I live with the uh, Mende in Sierra Leone. And every tribal group has a totally different culture. Their art is totally different. An equestrian figure is a symbol of power because in Africa you don't have a horse unless you're a powerful person. And some of the greatest equestrians are the ones related to the buffalo soldiers and those were the Bornu cavalrymen. Uh, there's a lidded vessel called the greatest shame. What it's speaking to, you know, it's speaking to slavery. The reason the turtle is leading the man is because the turtle is supposed to be wise because they live for hundreds of years. So we must follow the lead of the wisest among us, which would be the turtle. 
I would hope that people just come to embrace a better understanding of history and understand the humanity in people and how we are all humans. So many people have a superiority complex in this country. They're not going to admit anything and that's why I call it the shame, the greatest shame, because a lot of people are so ashamed. They don't want to, they don't want to look at that shame because they know it did and they, they all quick to say, well, I didn't have nothing to do with that. Well, I know you didn't, but you got to understand how some people that were affected by it were devastated spiritually, culturally, they were devastated and some people don't get over it. I just think you should understand and realize that some of the ideas that your ancestors passed on to you, you still have them. Even the Crocker family here were abolitionists. They fought, they were abolitionists and they fought against slavery. And I think that's something that people should know about. And, bring up, and, I, and, I, and I look at that and I think about, well, damn, you know, and, I'm, and finally I got an exhibit here at the Crocker. <laughs> you know, and that's a miracle because I never thought I would ever have an exhibit at this museum. I never thought that. People say that some things you got to be a genius to do something. Everybody's a genius. You know that? Everybody's a genius. All you have to do is have the desire and willing to struggle at it and try to learn it. You can learn it.